Murder most foul. The Baron of Rustenford is dead. A series of clues may lead you to those responsible, but time is of the essence, and who else will fall before you unravel? The Assassin's Knot, coming right up on RPG Retro Reviews. my channel RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school models and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. If you have a collection of pencils with dulled erasers, piles of polyhedral dice, and yet still yearn for more, or a massive collection of beautiful unpainted fantasy miniatures, you promise yourself you'll paint eventually. And this channel is for you. Welcome adventurer. If you enjoy this kind of content, then please click the subscribe button and feel free to explore my massive video library of reviews, tips, and musings on Dungeons and & Dragons and old school role playing games. A big shout out and thank you to Black Spire Fantasy for sponsoring this video. Are you interested in the style of old school role playing games, but would prefer the integration of a few modern mechanics into your system? Do you enjoy the works of Robert E. Howard, Carl Edward Wagner, and other authors of the pulp fantasy genre? If so, there's a new tabletop role-playing game on the horizon, Swords and Chaos, an RPG game that weds old-school and new-school design to produce a pulse-pounding sword and sorcery experience that is finely crafted to emulate the feeling of a classic tale straight from the pulps. Play larger-than-life characters in a grim and wicked age. Swords and Chaos is powered by the Siege Engine of Troll Lord Games, so if you are familiar with the OSR, Castles and Crusades, or even 5th edition, you will be able to dive right in with ease. Check out Black Spire Fantasy's Kickstarter right now. What are you waiting for? Pledge your allegiance to Swords and Chaos. And this week I'm taking a look back at the year 1983 to advance Dungeons and Dragons Module L2, The Assassin's Knot. This is the second adventure in the Lindor Isle series, the first being The Secret of Bone Hill, and the third is Deep Dwarven Delve. I've already given Bone Hill extensive treatment, so you might want to check that out before watching this video, but it's not required. Also, just a quick spoiler warning before I begin, I'm going to unravel the entirety of The Assassin's Knot here, which will absolutely ruin your enjoyment of the adventure if you desire to play in it. So, as usual, show this video to your DM in hopes they will wish to run it. With all that out of the way, let's begin. Like the previous entry, this module does describe in detail an entire town, Garotten. However, this adventure also introduces a rather intricate murder mystery plot. How interested and involved the players are in this mystery really depends on how engaged they were in the town of Restiford from the previous module. With a lot of old school modules, not playing the previous adventure wasn't that big a deal, but with this one, where the Baron of Restenford is murdered and the PCs are tasked with unraveling the mystery, I'd say it's very important, if not imperative, that an attachment to the Restenford family and perhaps even a romance with the Baron's daughter Andrella be developed. This is a low level adventure between levels 2 and 5, so the PCs could even be from Restenford. The key here is unless the PCs are somehow engaged with the town and its people, the DM may find it challenging to even justify the involvement of the PCs here. This is a rather complex event-based adventure that requires accurate timekeeping and careful introduction of time pressure to keep things moving. The module opens up with the assassination of the Baron of Rustenford. From that point, the heroes have about two weeks to unravel the mystery before the entire Rustenford family is murdered and Arnis, the mayor of the nearby town of Garotten, takes over. The PCs are contacted by the sorcerer Peltar of Rustenford and given details about the assassination. 
and the story begins from there. Once again, prior engagement with the sorcerer is very helpful here. Perhaps the party magic user is paying Peltor for new spells, or the party has helped the sorcerer with his research, or both. Either way, a reason why Peltor would engage the PCs in this manner helps move the plot along in a reasonable way. From Peltor, the PCs learned that the Baron was found strangled at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, and there are three clues. A small red ruby found near the body, a red leather button found in the Baron's hand, and a golden loot string was discovered under the bed. Efforts to raise the Baron from the dead or use speak with dead have failed. The clues correspond to three visitors to Rustenford from the town of Groton. A man wearing a blue robe with the symbol of three barracuda on it ate at the Rustenford Inn. The symbol is that of the sea goddess Osprum. There was also a traveler at a local tavern who played the lute and had a few drinks. And the lute had unusual golden strings. And finally, a man came into Rustenford to buy a few barrels of beer and have them shipped to his inn in Garotten. He wore a distinctive red vest with ornate red buttons. The wine merchant identified the button found in the Baron's hand as matching that of this person. The guard at the southern gate remembers each of the men, and Peltor is fairly certain of the men's identities. The first is that of Harper, the high priest of the Church of Osprin. The second is Balmaro, a theater owner in Groton, and the third is a man named Abraham, that town's innkeeper. Of course, the town of Groton has a foul reputation with the folk of Restonford. And with a name like Garotten, what does one expect? Heck, there's a common phrase among the townsfolk. If you want someone killed, go to Garotten. Once again, prior to the introduction of this adventure, if the DM can somehow organically work this phrase into the roleplay with townsfolk around Restonford, then all the better. From this point forward, the adventure is an open sandbox with a lot of moving pieces in place, various subplots involving other NPCs, and time pressure to keep the players on their toes. However, the players will very likely be keeping the DM busy as well, as the PCs can take virtually any number of avenues to resolve the mystery of Baron Restenford's assassination, and how the adventure flows will have a lot to do with how well the DM has prepped the adventure's introduction and understands the material presented. The above-mentioned subjects are, of course, all innocent of any wrongdoing, as this is all misdirection, as the evidence was planted by the actual assassin, Tellish, who snuck into Castle Restenford using his cloak of ethereliness, and was hired by Qualton, the insane abbot of the Church of Falcon in Restenford. The megalomaniac wishes to assume power in Restenford and believes he can have the Baron murdered, seduce the Baron's daughter Andrella, and then assume the throne, so to speak. It's quite possible that if the PCs had played through the secret of Bone Hill, they will already have an idea of how crazy the abbot is. The obvious next step based on the setup is to go to Garotten and investigate the three suspects. To that end, the module details the entire town and maps each of the locales given. The inn, the House of Abraham, is given quite a bit of detail. It is not just an inn, but also a tavern, and it's expected that the PCs might elect to stay there during their investigations and make it their base of operations. Interestingly, this module actually uses the psionic rules from the first edition player's handbook, as Abraham, the innkeeper, has psionic powers. He knows something is up, and this little detail is clearly unknown to the Assassin's Guild. Thus, Abraham can prove to be a valuable ally and source of information, and is the logical first place to visit. However, the Guild has spies planted at the inn, so the Mayor Arnis will know of their investigation. Abraham knows the other two suspects the PCs are investigating and will speak positively of the Bard Balmoro and the priest Harper from the church. The House of Abraham is given rich detail and full map treatment on the cardstock cover. 
The rooms themselves include secret trap doors in the floor so that when PCs return from their investigations to their rooms, they will found to have been ransacked. Also, it's quite possible an assassination attempt will be made on sleeping PCs. Within two days of their arrival, Abraham will be arrested, put on trial, and promptly executed unless the PCs intervene. So already there's interesting developments in the story, and this is just one location. Next up is the Church of Ospern. Like the inn, it is also given full treatment. NPCs, a reasonably functional map, and the presence of an Assassin's Guild spy named Lothar. The High Priest Harper is a senile old man and not much of a threat. Though harmless, he will cast a spell at the drop of a hat, and certainly the DM can have a lot of fun role-playing him. The module gives extensive notes on the NPCs at the church, the Assassin's Guild actions here, and how to run the church and its ceremonies. Next up is the Theater of the Mystic, the home of the Bard Balmaro. Like the other locales, there is an Assassin's Guild spy here, and the NPCs are covered in rich detail. The map of the theater and the acting troupe's house is not given as full a treatment as the other two locations, but there is a lot of information to be gained here, but at a cost. Marmaro knows the names of the two guild spies at the House of Abraham and is willing to sell each name for 750 gold pieces each. There is the opportunity for swashbuckling action, Earl Flynn style, as well as the chance to gain allies in the theater troupe, depending on how the PCs act and play things out. The other detailed locale in Groton is Groton Castle itself, the home of the Assassin's Guild and the mayor of the town, Arnis. The PCs will most likely first encounter this location when they are summoned to the place within a few days of their arrival. Arnis will forbid the PCs from investigating the Baron's assassination, saying that she can keep order in her own town, further attempting to delay them. If Abraham is actually executed, she will claim that the assassin was hired by the sorcerer of Rustenford Piltar. A direct assault on Groton Castle will most likely result in the death, capture, and or execution of the PCs unless they've cultivated some allies along the way, such as the theater troupe. The Assassin's Guild itself isn't that large, consisting of only 13 total members, including Arnas and the actual guilty party, the Assassin Telish. The Guild's plan at this point is to manipulate events and use them to their advantage in a grab for power. There is a detailed timeline of events given, and unless the BCs unravel the Assassin's Knot, the Telish will assassinate the Baroness of Rustenford, the daughter Arella, and the insane priest Qualton. And thus, Arnis's grab for power will be complete, and she will assume control of Rustenford, and the PCs will have essentially failed. This module will require a lot of improvisation on the part of the DM, and if you've ever played this and remember it fondly, then you can credit your DM, because there is really no specific outcome here. The PZs are free to go and do as they will, but to its credit, the module provides a lot of guidelines as to how to adjudicate the various locales and associated NPCs. The assassins themselves are given motivations outside the scope of the plot. There are a few red herrings to cause the PCs to waste time, such as when the spy assassin from the House of Abraham tells the tale of a monstrous devilfish upriver that attacks fishing boats or when the priest Harper invites the PCs to accompany him on a crab hunt. Thus, it is incumbent for the DM to read through this module carefully and get a good sense of everything that is going on. Role-playing opportunities abound, and I can't stress enough how much better this module will be if the players have spent time adventuring in Rustenford first and become engaged with the Baron and his family, heard a few rumors about Garotten, and met the insane abbot, and so on, before you introduce the assassination plot. In fact, if you cultivate this route, mentioning Garotten and the rumors about it a few times, it's entirely possible that the PCs will desire to visit the town before the assassination takes place to see what's up. Well, let them. Perhaps they might visit the House of Abraham and stay there a few days, and even make friends with the innkeeper. 
think of how much more impactful it will be later on down the road when their friend is arrested and about to be executed for Baron Restenford's murder. Thus consider L1 and L2 not as separate modules, but as one large adventure. Improved production values really add to the gravitas of this module. It has a double hardcover with both the standard TSR blue maps, but also a full color town map of Groton and a surrounding area map that is perfect for standing up to use as a screen to show your players the area map and the town map. The interior of that cover also has the Groton Castle map with its lower level. The outer cover's interior has the detailed House of Abraham map and an amazingly handy town table that gives the DM an accounting of all the NPCs in the town, classes, ages, location, and other handy data to assist in adjudicating the adventure. I really like the maps of the House of Abraham, although there is a bit of mystery not exactly detailed in the module, and that is the reason for these secret doors under the carpet in the guest rooms. Why are they there? How is it the Assassin's Guild is using them without Abraham's knowledge, especially given his psionic powers? It does state that Abraham has spied on two of the guests, Philmar and Oscar, using his clairaudience psionic ability from under their rooms and knows they are evil and suspects them as being part of the Assassin's Guild. Though the discovering of the secret trap doors might throw suspicion on Abraham during the PC's investigations and serve as a red herring. Also, while there is a large-scale wilderness map of the surrounding area, it doesn't show its relationship to Restenford, which is unfortunate. The cover art for The Assassin's Knot is probably one of my least favorite covers. It's very weird looking and with out of proportion characters and the artist is uncredited as is all the interior art and I was unable to nail down exactly who did the interior art so if anyone knows let me know in the comments. The cartography is credited to Stephen D. Sutherland. Getting an original copy of this module is not that difficult though you may need a bit of patience. Copies in good quality with no interior marks go for a lot higher price, but you can find decent copies for around $25 to $30. Unfortunately, Drive Through RPG does not yet have this available for print on demand, even though the other two modules in the series are, which is a bit frustrating. The PDF can be purchased for a very reasonable $5, however. So, let's go ahead and take a look at L2 The Assassin's Knot on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, the trade dress here is of the higher quality mid-1980s trade dress. While the cover art is a travesty, I really like the interior artwork, many of which are quite evocative. I love the House of Abraham art and the assassin outside the castle. While not this era's best, it's functional, so I'll rate this a 14. As for presentation, Lakafka does a phenomenal job of giving the DM the tools they will need to adequately run the adventure, and given the fondness that many players hold for this module, I would submit that a lot of DMs were able to pull this off successfully. There are a lot of moving pieces and character motivations. This module benefits from enhanced character development and interesting NPCs, more so than other modules from this era. Also note, there are virtually no monsters. Most of the interactions and conflicts are between humans and demi-humans, which is also a rather unique trait of this adventure. That said, in order to run this module properly, the DM will need to do their homework and thoroughly read through this module. 31 pages, there is a lot of content here. Also, the Kafka's naming conventions leave a lot to be desired. While it's great that most of the NPCs have names, a lot of them are just weird or strange. I'm going to rate this an 18. Finally, let's talk value. Even at, say, $30 for a hard copy off eBay, there is a lot of meat here. Even after the assassination plot is resolved, the detailed town of Groton remains for the DM to use in his campaign, along with Restenford, the sheer volume of NPCs here can definitely keep a campaign going for years. I'll go ahead and give this a 19. And that brings my overall rating 
for L2, the Assassin's Knot, to a 17. Very good. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this retro module review useful and fun. Next week, I'll be finishing up my look at the Lendor Isle series with Deep Dwarven Delve and a few other things that I think you might enjoy. Also, I had the privilege to do a sit down with Ben Milton of Questing Beasts as part of his Ask Dungeon Master series. Thanks, Ben. That was a lot of fun. Look for that video later on this week on Ben's channel. A link to the Questing Beast channel is in the description. Of course, let me thank my patrons who make these videos possible. Give this video a like, comment below, and share. Check out my Teespring store for great gaming swag and t-shirts. Get into my retro review community on Facebook and at me at Twitter. And of course, maybe become a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through my PayPal tip jar. As always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.